I played through Enchanted Arms because you have no time to game. <laughs> What happens when you get a man-child that's played too much God Hand and it's left him with the mental faculties of a five-year-old? They go on an adventure with a talking brick wall that exudes Chad energy, an angry small dwarf female that, like all dwarfs, loves gold, and a Disney princess. Well, what happens is you get Enchanted Arms, from the acclaimed indie developers from Software, known for small titles such as Dark Souls and Elden Rings, that not many people have played. This game predates those and holds the esteem, I believe, of being the first JRPG for both Xbox 360 and PS3. But this is no Souls-like game, even if throughout the game you do get that from soft feel, you know, where the looks and the backgrounds and such feel very from soft. It was directed by Masato Miyazaki, no, not that Ghibli guy, and no, not the other one that works from Pomcester. He's his own person, damn it. So I played this using RPCS3, using the PS3 version on PC. Um, I believe that version has more golems in it, so that's why I went with that one. It took me about 30 hours to finish, not doing the post-game content. And like I said, developed by From Software, published by them as well, Ubisoft handling the publishing outside of Japan. It first came out in 2016 on the 360 and a year later on PS3. What sort of game is it? I hear you gesticulate. Well, as I said, it's a JRPG and it has many of the staples you expect from said genre. So that being a world you explore, people you can talk to, and in this case the combat is turn-based, not action or anything like that, with its own unique twist. So let's first discuss the combat, shall we? Well, you get a grid on each side, not Final Fantasy Tactics or anything like that style, each side has its own grid that you can move around it. So characters take turns, your entire team gets to move, their entire team gets to move. And they move around the grid within their limited movement range. And then they have tacks that, or, or you know, like buffs, debuffs, curing, whatever, that then have a range in said grid. Kind of like Final Fantasy Tactics in that regard. But yeah, so you might have like a straight line might have one spot or like a cross, whatever. And whatever's in that gets hit, healed, etc. And your entire team goes. It's quite interesting though. Um, the order of which you select the people and their movement and actions is the order of things actually happen. So if you want to heal the group and they're in one position, and that's a good position for healing, you'd move your healer first, cast the spell, and then they can all take their turn, which might involve them moving to different spots to do attacks, and they might have then moved out of healing range. So the order in which you select everyone is quite important. Adds a bit of tactical depth to it, which is nice. Yeah, so the character's growth in this game is quite interesting as well. So you have traditional levels that buff your stats. Uh, the stats are kind of a bit different to normal. You have HP and EP. EP being like your kind of action points. Um, you have direct range and support instead of things like strength and stuff like that. There's no defense stat, but direct affects your like physical direct attacks. Ranged affects your ranged abilities, and support affects any sort of like healing or any skills that use support power. You also have agility, which affects how much VP you have. VP being a frustrating mechanic that after every battle you're, if you haven't attacked and killed the enemy fast enough your VP slowly reduces and when you run out of VP the character will start a battle with 1 HP and 1 EP. There's also a combo mechanic. Everyone gets a combo bar that fills up and when it's full if they hit the same enemy as someone else um, and someone else is attacking that same enemy they get an extra buff to the attack as they attack together as a team. Um, you also have the EX gauge, which allows you to use everyone's kind of super moves. Now, super moves in this can be buffed by shaking the controller. Because I was playing the like uh, emulated version using a retro 8-bit do controller and not a PlayStation controller, you'd shake it to um, 
it used the like dual shocks shaking feature to power up the attack so i never got to use that because i didn't use a playstation controller uh, but whatever it didn't really affect it much um yeah so like i was saying you get level ups which buff all your stats but then you also get sp after every mission along with experience points and your money the sp can be spent on learning new skills that you bought from the shop or buffing your parameters so you literally can spend sp to buff each one of your stats and the more you buff them the higher the cost goes so it can get quite expensive towards the end uh, the other thing is you have human characters which I, like i said can learn skills but you also get golems which you think of like um, a monster capturing kind of mechanic where you don't actually catch them you can either buy them or beat them on the map and then you just get their core and you can you have to make them using gems you can find or buy in the shop um so from this the golems themselves can't actually learn new skills they have set skills but they can buff their parameters so any sp you get for them just is spent on parameters you don't have to worry about teaching them new skills the nice feature as well is everyone that you've got after every battle get some of the XP so even if you're not using the golems they're still leveling up with you in the background so the more golems you get the, the more things you more choice you have personally though throughout the game I didn't really use many of the golems except to fill out your party because you can take four people into battle and if I didn't have all four human characters then I would use a golem to fill out any missing people there's also two other human characters you get briefly but uh you don't really get to use them much apart from the beginning and the end of the game but yes anyway so that's how most of the gameplay the world traveling it there's no world map in this it's literally just one from place to place there's short sections that lead from one city to the next it's not particularly complicated the dungeons themselves aren't particularly complicated at all the game is quite simplistic on that front visually though like i said it kind of has the from software feel like London City looks like a proto Anor London, uh, Anor Londo, and they're just moments like when you see these ruins and stuff like that that just feel very from soft in design. It's all quite nice, like it's early PS3 360, but it still looks visually quite good. The soundtrack's all right. There's some variety to it. Nothing really stands out from it. But then again, as I've always said, I'm not much of a sound person. There's a casino mini game which is quite important because if you want to get everything without having to grind the high heavens use a casino is a must very simple to exploit <laughs> um, but yeah that's the uh, gameplay overall so time to break down the story and this is going to go into massive spoilers beware the game opens on our erstwhile hero Atsuma the person that has the so called enchanted arm not we know what that means beyond you know it messes with enchantments that being like the magic or magical construct of this world and his arm basically stops it working whenever he touches them the opening scene definitely sets up what our character is and not the smartest tool in the shed and a bit of a battle maniac we find him sleeping in class while his friend mr sparty pants toya and flamboyant makoto okay let's just take a second to discuss something about makoto he is very obviously gay and has a mega crush on Toya. But the treatment of this is it's just that. No snarky comments that you might see in like other games. Makoto is gay and that's fine. Just as it should be in all games. This is good. It's refreshing and a little surprising to see as we know the games, especially JRPGs, haven't always touched on this subject that well in the past. So to see this in a game from over 15 years ago uh, it shows, just shows it can be done right and no modern games have an excuse not to do it and handle it correctly so Atsuma's friends discuss whether it's worth waking him up or not before the professor discovers Atsuma's transgression okay okay taking a second number two let's look at this professor professor Ko he has the look of a friggin end game villain big bad guy it's all in purple his clothes are made out of the bloody souls of the damned look there's mouths on his clothes. Well, anyway, they don't wake him up. The prof demands that Atuma takes on the practical. 
which acts as our first tutorial given by Toya on how to battle and we crush a golem. Golems are a key element of this world created by enchanters. They're a magical machine that comes in all shapes and sizes to help in everything from cooking and cleaning to security. After class, the group head off to the cafeteria for lunch and we find out a little bit more about Atsuma's life is like. He's a bit of a social pariah due to his arm having the ability to disrupt enchants, which in an academy for enchanters means people are a bit scared of him. Ironically though, he's actually a natural born enchanter as well. He can just seem to do things. Uh, this has grown to the point there appears to be a bunch of people that are dangerously obsessed with Atsuma to the point they formed the Anti-Atsuma Alliance. And while Toyo is the polar opposite, smart, uninformed, and the single most liked person around, but has a bromance with Atsuma, as they've been friends forever, Toyo is willing to go along with pretty much anything Atsuma is up to, much to the chagrin of Makoto. And well, the next plan is to ditch class and attend the local festival of Yokohama, celebrating the rise of the city after a world war 1,000 years prior. So off the unlikely trio go, after feeding Atsuma's dog Kota, committing a series of violent offences that would probably wear the jail time against any student or teacher that gets in their way. The festival is in full swing, but Atsuma only has one goal, and that's the golem battles. So doing so, some bitch work to earn tokens to get a golem of her own. Wait, j j what the fuck is that? No, 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 j that thing is terrifying. <sighs> Deep breath. Pizza golem can't hurt you. The golem battle goes planned, and that's who we're sharing his skill in battle until Yuki appears, a gun-toting, golem-hunting cowgirl, who on defeat just won't accept it, and after being defeated, wants a rematch, because, well, she can't afford to lose. And she needs to be the richest person in the world. But at this point, the world heaves. Fleeing the arena, the group discover a world gone mad. The golems are revolting, attacking everyone. You pizza golems were evil. So our group go out to save people and batter the demented golems, but it's not long until snow starts falling. The snow snaps the very life force out of non enchanters. Zimmer decides he needs to go to the academy to check on Kota, so rushes back, saving Yuki from a military grade bot on route. So she still doesn't join, she just runs off. They find the academy is also in ruins, which Toya drops should be possible as it's protected by an ancient barrier. And the only explanation is magic. This is explained in some sort of pseudoscience bullshit. Where enchanting is like positive and creates. <laughs> um, but the magic that's being used is negative, so it's not enchantment, which means it might be an ancient lost magical powers because the world used to do be able to do more with magic and enchanting is just like a small facet of magic as a whole and you also find out like Atsuma's arm isn't magic because it has it's not negative or positive it's nullification at this point Atsuma finds Kota he runs off into the sealed ward so the group go in find themselves in a massive underground facility powered by massive magical machines. After exploring this underground facility and witnessing some more of Atsuma's level of intelligence, the group make it to the centre. Just, just before entering, Atsuma has a strange moment where his arms talking to him drives him to find a devil golem, an ancient weapon of mass destruction, but it's not fully powered yet. So that unlikely trio try to fight it, but even not at full strength, the battle's to no avail. Toy shows his badass sides, but ends up sacrificing himself to save Atsuma, while Makoto is crushed by a giant rock. Atsuma's arm kind of takes over, using Atsuma's rage at seeing Makoto hurt. He smashes the ice pitch, but runs out of juice just before landing the killing blow, and Atsuma collapses. The Queen of Ice takes our lovely toy as a pet and decimates the city of Yokohama. Asuma awakens to find himself in a cell in London City, alone, but not for long, as Kareen, a new companion, appears in wonderful fashion. And together, well sort of together, the Jiro try a really shitty escape plan that Kareen ruins. But enter Rygar stage left, smashing through the wall, his mountain of armour and sword, rescue the duo and off they go, escaping through an underground prison. 
through London City's dam and sewers and eventually into the city proper. Tyr, Asuma discovers firstly that Yokohama has been destroyed and he doesn't know anything about what's happened to his friends. The Queen admits she was deliberately caught to find Asuma and he's needed for an operation to stop the King of London City's Caliban who intends to awaken the Emperor of Fire, another de devil golem, sealed under the city. Because they kind of plan to use the Emperor of Fire to fight the Queen of Ice, you know, sending giant monsters to fight each other, it's always a good plan. But showing some basic intelligence for once, Asuma's demands to go see Yokohama for himself, but not before questioning the relationship between Raikar and Kareem. These options are amazing. London City is a kind of a weird stereotype of England. It hurts my soul being, you know, English. In this world where magical golems and some fancy tech, London is a medieval town where everyone dresses like they're out of the medieval times. And of course, it's one big castle. And they have a pub. You know, everything that's English. But anyway, after leaving the pub, they pop out to find a group of knights giving a speech about how London is amazing because it has order and Yokohama sucks because it let itself get destroyed. Pretty harsh, really. But anyway, we don't hang around for long before buggering off on the road to Yokohama. But of course, there's been a landslide, a quick diversion through a forest, running into Yuki, the queen of Golem Hunters, once again, who runs off almost straight away, then going through an abandoned military base. Small interlude here. Just before the military base is a tiger golem that offers to fight you. I'm writing this as I'm playing through the game, but I have no idea what this thing is. But do not fight it. You will die. I'm guessing it's some sort of legendary golem. Anyway, back to going through the military base, which is a super simple area with an easy ass boss. The group pop out near the bridge to Yokohama, running into the mega douche knight number one, Oka, who blows up the bloody bridge. Zuma nearly lays a smackdown on him, but Rygar holds him back. The diversion that Oka's just done proves to basically be pointless, as you can just go to like the right and cross the river by swimming. It's really simple. A three-year-old can figure it out. Finally, after arriving at Yokohama, we see an ice wasteland before us, and that Zuma gets a bit quiet. Defeating yet another weird golem, Yuki appears once more. This time, Atsuma actually tells her to do one, instead of being patient with her. At the boy, Atsuma. Not long before progressing through the port, the group finds themselves face to face with the minions of the Ice Queen. Come to the, realis come to the realization that the city has basically become one giant golem nest. Atsuma eventually arrives at the school, feeling very depressed, until he hears Kota. Look, forgive me if I'm wrong. Atsuma moaning about how he got everyone killed because he insisted on rescuing Kota, then immediately chasing after Kota again. <sighs> but anyway, cute doggy. Kota leads us to a mysterious lab full of Atsuma's arms and Professor Ko, who, surprise, surprise, is a bad guy. The purple mouth coat didn't give it away. And to prove just how evil he is, he tells Atsuma that he's a living weapon, not a human, and turns Kota into a disgusting monster. After defeating Kota, Atsuma chases Ko, a trap separates him from Kareen and Rygar, but not long before a mysterious fellow appears to break the trap. While separated, Atsuma comes across Ko, the Queen of Ice and Toya. Toya is twisted and has become the magic of the Queen of Ice, basically like her battery. We get a lot of exposition, basically Atsuma's arm at least is a devil golem, possibly, or has devil golem bits to it, and him being towards, pulled towards the Queen of Ice, that it was his presence that freed her, or the power of the arm or whatever freed her. Ko lets on that he's been in position to monitor and look after Atsuma by the military. And he was basically using Atsuma as a weapon. Uh, but the military decided that he was too dangerous to use. So every after every use they had to wipe Atsuma's memory. And they decided that actually being as dangerous as he is, just to let him live a bit of a normal life. So hence going to the school. But, you know, Ko couldn't let it die because he's an obsessed maniac. And went to the school with 
Atsuma to continue trying to study his arm. He keeps referring to Atsuma as a weapon, but Atsuma is adamant that he's human. Uh, so at this point, Rygar and Kareem run in, and we wipe the floor with Ko, and Queenie betrays Ko, even if they look like they were working together, by stabbing him in the balls with a dragon eye stick, and then teleports off with a little pet toy. Ko dies, woo! And the place collapses, with the mysterious man saving everyone, even if Asuma feels like he wants to die at this point. Kareem makes him stick to his promise and drags him back to London City. It was at this point that I took a small interlude because the shop had been updated with shiny new toys and, well, I was lacking the TV to buy them all. And London City happens to have a casino. A casino which can be abused to break the game, potentially. But anyway, the long-winded way to make money there is using golem battles. Probably a bit more fun. Choose a fight you can win easily on auto and repeat until happy. I recommend about 100k coins to start with. There's also a bingo and spinning wheel games. The main coin earner is the roulette. All you need to do is save before you spin, bet a thousand coins that you've just bought on 1 to 12 to start with, and if you win, save it. Keep doing this until you've got about 12,000 coins, and then you can make 12 individual 1,000 coin bets on like whatever numbers you want. Save them just before you do this. And if you win, you net 36,000 coins back. It took me about 15 minutes to get 100k coins. I was able to buy all the stuff in the prize exchange, but the coins aren't money. So what you need to do is buy the healing item from the exchange and go and sell it at the shop. Go back to the casino, buy the healing items to Max again, back to the shop. This is showing one of the most egregious elements of the game in that you can only have a maximum of nine items in each case. So it's frustrating because if I go to buy 99, it made it like a lot quicker. And most of the time is spent doing this. They're running backwards and forwards. But anyway, yeah, it can you can easily get all the stuff in the shop doing this. It doesn't take that long. 15 to 20, 30 minutes at most. Um, I did it until I had 300 k TB and I had to buy all the skills and golems and gems and everything I needed to make all the golems. And if you truly want to break the game at this point, buy the skill point item in the shop and you can use that that to power up all your parameters of every character and completely break the game and make it a breeze. I didn't do that though. So anyway now that we've developed a gambling addiction we can head off into the castle proper which leads us to two dumbass guards that let us in because Kareen is there. Interesting. Inside the castle we come across Oka and a noble and they have an interesting scene about the rebellion Okay, so now we have to go through a secret door. This has to be the dumbest secret door I have ever seen. The panel to open it is right next to the door and it's a giant glowy red light. Kind of sums up this game's level of intelligence or the way it treats everyone overall, intelligence wise. As in, it treats you like you don't have any. But anyway, after a small cave section and yet another meeting with Yuki, the group find themselves in Dolmen Ruins, where the so-called Resistance is based. And it was at this moment that it hit me that this is a FromSoft game. The ruins here just wouldn't look out of place in any of the Souls games. And it really has that, that feel that the other games invoke. Going into the base, we find that the spy has been captured. And yes, this so-called spy is Yuki who is being questioned by the leader and some creepy ass dude that is obviously not a bad guy. Trading that tight um, with an mm, interesting scene, we finally meet the Arsenal leader, a dude that based on what happens next is obviously way out of his depth and just a plain idealist with a single goal. He gives a riveting uplifting speech but is quickly brought down by a couple of pegs by Kareen's questions and comments. After this meeting, Kareen is in a rare dying moment. Oh, Kareen, in a rare moment of kindness, offers to cook for hungry Atsuma. Much to Rygar's chagrin, and well, the food she produced is, well, mosaicked out. I don't think I've ever seen the mosaic used for that before. All Atsuma hears before collapsing is, Yusuke, is Yuki and Kareen shouting for a medic. Atsuma, in a haze, actually thinks that he's died but it comes around to find Rygar caring for him. This next scene is interesting in a very sort of classical male bonding way. 
as Atsuma questions Rygar about Kareen and his arm. And Rygar basically confirms he will kill Atsuma if he goes rogue. And Atsuma is manly, bro's response about this. But it's kind of another moment of showing Atsuma slowly building growth as a character. He doesn't question Rygar on this. He's just like, yep, I'm not going to get after that. It makes sense if you need to put me down. And it's more relieved than anything, really. Rygar leaves, giving a present for yet another victim of Kareen's cooking. And we get to explore the base a bit more and talk to the folk. It really doesn't inspire confidence in this resistance group at all. Anyway, we find Yuki on the roof and she calls Atsuma an empty shell and decides to start a fight with him to try and bring back his fighting spirit. So we kick her ass again. But after, Atsuma does seem a bit more lively. And while starting to confess her undying love for our lead character, the Knights of London attack. Yuki and Asuma double team the scout force, rushing in to inform Kareen, who then uses her Super Queen power of speech to rile up the resistance, hoping to prove themselves more than just talk and actually put their words into action. But the leader's first reaction is to run and look for someone else to blame, as opposed to actually do anything. But Kareen manages to inspire the rabble into actually defending themselves. Asuma pushes back the first wave of the forces, heading back inside to find Oka, and another fight ensues. Defeating Oka, Rygar lets him leave, and this sheds suspicion on him by the Arsenal leader and the giggling idiot sidekick. They uh, think because he let Oka go, he's a traitor. But um, Atuma lets slip that Oka is actually Rygar's brother, three seconds after finding out himself. This just proves that... And this is just used as further proof that Rygar is in fact a traitor. Rygar lets himself be taken prisoner. Now three heroes set out to prove his innocence. After some busy work, we weren't able to come up with a clear evidence, and Kareen loses her shit at Atuma, who decides to just go better and just leave her. Kareen stays up and manages to listen in on the conversation between the giggling freak and the Arsenal leader. Turns out, hey, they're in cahoots with the Baron and Oka, who wants the magic car, which is in the Dolmen Ruins. And they're also planning on using Kareen as leverage over the royal lineage. Kareen chases them when they run away after they're taking the magic car, but is quickly caught by Oka. Our mysterious friend drops a letter off with the imprisoned Rygar, dealing to detailing what is happening, as Atuma and Yuki confront the Arsenal leader in the morning, who is saying that Kareen stole the Magikor, and trying to incite everyone against Kareen and Rygar even more. Rygar breaks through the wall, as he is wont to do, and shows the letter to everyone, who um, beat the shit out of the leader for betraying them. Our hapless crew go and face Oka, <laughs> smashing the giggly man and his little golem. Yet another lovely example of freaky ass designs they have in this game. Rygar lets Oka go again after defeating him. Kareen has an existential crisis briefly before turning back into herself and ordering everyone around to find the fire magic core that has been left behind. Atsuma is the one who finds it and after touching it with his arm goes into a trance. Talking to the Emperor of Fire he refers to the entity in his arm as Master. The arm tries to get Atsuma to summon the Emperor. Snapping out of the trance Atsuma awakens just in time for the Queen of Ice to show up again. This time she has disabled most of Toya's emotions, but she lets him have some back just to taunt Atsuma some more, before offering a little game. Summon the Emperor of Fire before she destroys London. Before we get very far, we meet Oka again, and this time Rygar has a one-on-one -on -one fight, ending in only one way. Moving on into the chamber, yet more loss is about to happen as the Queen of Ice has taken the king into her grasp, and after a round of taunting, because you know, she just can't help being a bitch, she slays the king, Kareen's father. Kareen finds vengeance, and the Queen of Ice awaits them in the Infernal Temple, the sleeping place of the Emperor of Fire. Just before getting to the temple, some of the lackeys appear, but the mysterious stranger once again appears, destroying them, and asks Atsuma to save Toya. The plot thickens, she doth proclaim. Into the temple we go. A flashback happens on the entry where we learn Kareen, being of royal blood, could in fact become a human magic whore for the Devil Golem, in the same way that Toya is a magic whore 
for the Queen of Ice. As this was the intended way for the Devil Golem to be used, the Devil Golem with a human core, and the human core being strong enough to exert some level of control over the Golem. But because of the weakening of bloodlines, people now just aren't strong enough to control the Devil Golems. So they, while they can still be used as a magic core, they aren't strong enough to actually like command them. Well, I must admit, at this point I thought I knew what was going to happen. It's going to be a bit of a fight, we're going to fight the Emperor of Fire, etc. But no! When we get to the centre, Kareem runs up to the Emps, because Atsuma won't fight Toya. She becomes the magic core, and the Queenie and the Emps have a kick up, resulting in both being hurt. Mystery Man appears again to give advice to Atsuma. He must use his arm to save Kareem. With the Emps in a weakened state, the crew attempt to subdue him and free her from the merging fully and becoming wholly a magic core. And to free her, Atsuma must use the true power of absorption. It can absorb ether, which is why it breaks enchantments. So after an epic fight, Atsuma unleashes his arm properly, exerting some level of control over it, and absorbs the fire dude, catching Kareen as she breaks out of the magic core. Atsuma has another moment in Dreamland where his arm tells him to obey and he's like, nah bro, go after yourself, basically. Waking from his most recent delusion, Atsuma finds himself in a broken London, where everyone for the first time is working together, nobles, knights and peasants, all working together to rebuild it. And after some busy work, we see a group of layabouts discussing Yokohama and the Devil Golems, and their conversation sends Atsuma into a bit of a funk once more. So Yuki starts to fight with him, you know, as she does, and then Kareem is uncharacteristically soft, thanking Atsuma for saving her and the city, and even offering a place long term in London, which Atuma kindly rejects for the moment. This whole section feels like growth in the way of the characters and for the way the game's actually treating us as players. So Atsuma dealing with loss and seeing the other characters deal with that loss and death and carrying on persevering is growing. He seems less childlike and becoming more of a person, more of an adult dealing with things, driving forward, and the game has stopped treating us at the level it was, as treating Atsuma as well, as in the, like early in the game we were being treated as, that is a ladder, you must press the button to climb the ladder, because you know ladders are meant to be climbed, it stopped that uh, so much, and it's actually treating us like people who might, you know, be able to play a game. But there's also another point I'd like to talk about at this moment, and that's the relationship between Toya and Atsuma. They're obviously great friends, and I think Toya finds Atsuma interesting and refreshing compared to everyone else. But Atsuma, considering his mental state and distinct lack of intelligence early on, I feel that it's one-sided, benefits-wise. Atsuma relied on Toya for everything, it seems, to the point he's almost incapable of thinking for himself. And if you think about what was happening to him, he was being sent out as a weapon and then having his mind wiped constantly. So he wasn't ever really learning anything or be able to grow. But now that's not happening. So he's finally been able to grow as a person, grow into himself. He's made new friends. He was treating him as a person with like actual intelligence. Yes, he'll never be a scientist. But he is actually a pretty competent and reliable person. But each time he meets Toya, he seems to lose that sense of growing independence and reverts back to how he was. Like, I don't know what to say. The relationship between Toya and Atsuma feels a little bit toxic or bad. But considering the unique circumstances around Atsuma, he kind of needs the freedom and the time to grow. But it might be only seen this way because of Professor Ko's influence and Toya doesn't actually like him. But anyway, by the time we inevitably save Toya, hopefully Atsuma's grown enough to be an equal in the relationship and not the dependent. Or like, you know, like just a bit of entertainment for Toya. Hopefully they are they are equals at the end. That's what we're hoping for. Anyway, back to the story. Atsuma heads back to the castle meeting the mystery man on the way, who questions Atsuma's commitment to saving Toya. Atsuma questions whether it's worth saving one for the many. And upon talking to Rygar inside the castle, 
as Huma reaffirms his drive to save Toy. He sets off for Kyoto by himself. Um, as Rygar tells him he could learn a special technique to control his arm there, which could be useful, you know. Setting off in the morning, he says goodbye alone to London, but just as he says goodbye, Kareem, Yuki and Rygar standing behind him and also start saying goodbye one after the other after Atsuma says it. They were waiting for him, deciding to join him on his journey. You know, Kareem's a princess and the king's dead, but you know what, forget it. She has good people. But yeah, Rygar had told them all about what Atsuma was doing and they decided to join him. And they find out they need to go to Junk City first before getting to Kyoto. I'd just like to point out here, there cannot be any trade between Junk City and London because the path is non-existent. The only way to get there is by using enchanting skills to like whiplash your way across the world. So how would a normal merchant even be able to, to like traverse the path? Especially with all the rampaging golem stuff. Never mind, this fancy world, we, we don't question these things. Um, but yes. Anyway, upon arriving at Junk City, we learn that this is Yuki's hometown. And she offers to be our tour guide. Well, kind of forced to be our tour guide. But within seconds of entering, she runs off. So we get to explore the town for a bit. Before being dragged into some nonsense. Someone has stolen a magical instrument from the richest person in town. Fubile. And upon getting his useless guard buried in the sand, he sees Yuki and instantly knows the mysterious item was stolen by her. Well, Atsuma isn't having any of this, so goes off to prove her innocence, only to slowly learn that, you know, it probably was Yuki. Speaking to a boy with a dog, we discover that Fabile stole the flute from this lad in the first place. And the flute's supposedly capable of summoning a legendary golem. That's why he wanted it. He likes... Junk City is based around, like, um, digging into all these broken machines and golems from the from the golem wars. And that's how they make a living. And any special items Fubal seems to steal from people before they can sell it. Because, you know, he wants to be the richest person around. The group decide that, um, as Fubal is also a thief, they can forgive Yuki for being a thief. <laughs> and smash their way into his house and rescue Yuki. But not before giving the flute back to the kid, because we find it in Yuki's house. <laughs> On freeing Yuki, she throws a fit at Atuma and rushes off to steal the flute back from the boy, and then rushes out by herself to fight the legendary golem alone. We find out basically that she was after this flute and on a dangerous day because it was raining and stuff in the junk piles she caused a collapse and her brother died so she blames herself and the fact that she's poor because no one would help her without them paying first like without her paying them first so it's kind of like she took on the dream of her brother to become the best golem hunter but she's kind of twisted it she instead of just like being the best golem hunter she wants to be the richest and best by any means fair or foul but anyway, yeah, she rushes off to some of this legendary golem and she's no match for it. But fortunately, Atsuma, being the good guy, goes with everyone else and we defeat this supposed legendary golem. And Atsuma convinces Yuki that it only really counts being number one if she does it the right way, you know, not stealing from kids. So we attempt to give the flute back to the kid, but he doesn't want it. He just doesn't give a shit. He's just a good lad. Anyway, we head off to Kyoto, but just before we leave, a mysterious man appears again to warn us that Queen Bitch is hovering around Kyoto. After crossing a desert area, we find a nice cool marsh zone and stumble across a woman being attacked by a bloody ninja. Having no sense of self-preservation and, you know, not keeping your nose out of things, Kareen forces everyone into battle. We find out the woman that we saved is Sayaka and is Rygar's fiance. She offers to take us to Kyoto but unfortunately, it seems because of the Devil Golem, Kyoto City is sealed off, so we head for Sayaka's village. Everyone decides to stay at her house, and we discover, after Rygar gets chewed out by Sayaka's father, because, you know, well, he led an army and killed loads of the villagers in the war between London and Kyoto, that the secret art has been lost. The aesthetic monk of the aesthetic court may know a way of learning the technique, but to get access, we need permission from the Shogun Lord Tokimune. So after resting for light, we head off to meet this blubbering idiot. 
The meeting with this festering cesspool doesn't go well. But thanks to Sayaka, we get permission to enter. We need to grab a key. But hey, uh, Tokimune, being the douche he is, betrays us. And behind our back, he kind of orders the ninja to intervene. They intervene by kidnapping Kareen as we enter the shrine to get the key. And they take her back to the ninja highlight. The ninja's place is a stereotypical example of a dungeon in this game, where they're quite visually appealing in, in a certain way, but also extremely simple. The puzzles are not particularly puzzling and kind of just serve as a vessel to cause more random battles, it feels. At the end, at the underground, we find a device that siphons people of ether to feed the Lord of Earth. Lord of Earth being this area's devil golem. And Karine is currently inside this said machine, having her ether siphoned. So Rygar Rygar's all over the machine, freeing Karine. But just as we're about to leave Oboro, Oboro, the ninja leader turns up just in time to get his ass kicked. But he escapes by smoke bombing away. Going back to Tokumune, we fail our negotiations miserably again. And he sends Sayaka back to her village, uh, banning, you know, her from ever leaving it. But anyway, the group decide that we've got the key, we don't need Tokimoni's permission, and the aesthetic court being in Sayaka's village, we head back there. Uh, but because uh, Sayaka kind of follows her lord's bidding blindly without questioning anything, we end up in a fight with her. A bit of uh, soul searching from Rygar here. We defeat her, but refuse to kill her which kind of goes against her all honor thing. But uh, it's kind of this case of Rygar finally has his human emotion and he actually tells Sayaka how he feels, which seems to confuse her. <laughs> so we all rush into the court. It turns out to be a long mountain pass, eventually ending. We find the aesthetic monk, who is an interesting character that doesn't follow common sense. <laughs> After a bit of back and forth, he decides to teach Atsuma the secret technique, Gaia. But to learn it, he needs to retrieve something from the Lord of Earth's temple. And someone needs to act as a second. So if the power he's trying to learn uh, goes out of control, the second can kill him because he'd become a danger and basically, as far as I could grasp, he'd basically be like a berserker with the power of controlling him. So good old Rydgar steps up to the plate, readily ready to murder Atsuma at the drop of a hat. So off we go. Eventually arriving at the temple, the others did decide to follow as well because there's no actual rules about, you know, there not being a third or fourth or fifth. Um, anyway, after slapping around the guardian of the temple, Soma has a moment, but he manages to control himself as he's trying to get the item and acquires what he needs from the Lord of the Earth. And we return back to the monk, who informs us that by doing this, he's actually learnt the technique. Uh, in a gameplay sense, he gets a new EXE skill called Force Pain, which can actually negate the Devil Golem's regeneration powers. Story-wise, he can use the absorption ability somewhat himself now without kind of losing control of it. Anyway, by, back at the village, uh, Oboro is burning place down at the orders of Tokimune. So we run off the little doggy and uh, we decide that we need to slap Tokimuni around for his stupidity, hoping to, that we can bring some reason back to him. For Sayaka's sake, we don't want to kill him necessarily, but as much as I'd like to. But yes, arriving at Kyoto, the mystery man helps us break into the castle by pretending we are uh, by pretending we are prisoners, and then beating up the guards in the inside. And we finally face Tokimuni in battle, or should I say, Tokimuni and his um doll bodyguards and you know uh, other uses but anyway defeating him Obro turns up just in time to save Tokimuni from our godly wrath disappearing into a secret passage under the dude's golden toilet Yuki was right there literally are toilets made of gold in Kyoto before we catch up Obro gets Tokimuni to reveal the location of the Lord of Earth's magic core and it's kind of inside Tokimune. So Obro, deciding that he wants the magical, opens up Tokimune. You know, literally like opens him up, leaving him for dead. But yeah, it doesn't go well for Obro. 
as he kind of runs into the Queen of Ice, who one-shots him and takes the core for herself. So that's both Tokimune and Oboro dead. The crew arrive at the Lord of Earth's temple just in time for it to be awakened. The Queen does her classic mocking session before fleeing, leaving us to fight the Devil Golem. Defeating it just results in it changing form, but our favourite monk turns up and tells Atuma to use Gaia. So he does, smashing the barrier that the Lord of Earth had created with a single punch and then absorbing him in a much simpler way than he did the, the Emperor of Fire. Back at the village, everyone is trying to plan the next move, with the general consensus being that we kind of need to kill Toya. But Atuma ain't okay with that, and after talking to the aesthetic monk, Atuma decides that he's going to save Toya no matter what the others agree to. But anyway, his actual friends, not Sayaka and her, her dad, decide that they're going to help him. Um, but they need some advice. The next place to go is the Sage, a ancient being who lives in Volcano Pass who is meant to be all knowledgeable. Rygos seems a bit hesitant about this though. Um, after some nonsense, we make our way to the top of the Sage Tower and find one angry old lady who is pissed that her apprentice, Rygar, uh, has, hasn't been around for a while and refuses to acknowledge him but anyway after some back and forth nonsense there as well the Queen of Ice turns up and Toya goes full emo asking to die but anyway the Ice Queen invites us to her birthday party and we slap around one of her minions the sage has a good idea use the Queen of Ice's old magic or and it may create a disturbance in the force so we can extract Toya, who wants to merge with his love. Problem being, we don't know where the magic core is. So there's this whole thing of the humans can merge fully into the Devil Golems and become, kind of become one, officially become the magic core. When they're outside, they're not a full magic core, they just supply some power. But um, yeah, Toya hasn't quite merged, but she, he's going to in at this like birthday party not quite what they call it but you know anyway once they're merged together you can't like take them out without killing them basically even though some jiggery pokery happened that allowed Atuma to rescue Kareem before as she started to merge but we think because she wasn't fully merged she was able to get out but anyway so we need to figure out a way of saving Toya and killing the Queen of Ice this is grabbing the old Magikor Forcing that on the Queen of Ice should create a disturbance where we can pull Toya out effectively, doing like a switcheroo, and it shouldn't kill Toya. And then he would the connection would be broken because the other Magikor is there. But anyway, we need the Magikor. The Mystery Man has it, and we decide to meet up with him. But due to Atuma's lack of resolve, the Sage sends him into his mind space, and the arm tells Atsuma that they want him to follow his command so he can save mankind. Uh, and shows us kind of scenes of the Golem War and how out of control it was. It was a case of, it kind of has a twisted view from the past and doesn't match modern humans thinkings. So there's a bit of, it's not evil, his arm, but it's not good. Because it kind of wants to destroy the world and remake it how it was before the Golem War. But anyway, in his mind space, a space monster attacks him. Um, which we defeat and we get a god orb. The sage tells Atsuma that he's a good boy and decides to make him a weapon from the god orb he just collected from his mind space and brought into reality. I've stopped questioning anything a while ago at this point. <laughs> Knowing the sage a little more, Atsuma gets to rest, but Rygar talks to her again and this time discovering that Usuma was actually dumped at her tower as a baby and he was dying at the time so that's why he's we think he was dumped there his parents just left this dying baby hoping the sage may save him and she did by merging devil golem cells into his arm using a devil golem called infinity which is the voice we hear and infinity is actually the leader of the devil, devil golems anyway after receiving a shiny new weapon the crew head to grave home and um, we find a massive gate there uh, so we go to get a key from the village elder saving her in the process because you know this just happens everywhere we go but anyway in the night Atuma meets up with the mystery man and with conflicting ideals they fight it out 
Asuma finally winning over him and getting the magic ore. From there, we open the gate in the morning after some heart to heart with all our friends and we go into the Queen of Ice's temple for her birthday party. We fight Toya once more and he is trying again to kill himself but we find out that before allowing us to fight Toya though we see that the mystery man is got in there before us and offers to fight the Queen of Ice as long as um, Toya is allowed some freedom and he comes to fight us. We defeat him but refuse to kill him and he kind of goes to merge back with the Queen of Ice. And after several rounds of fighting with the Queen of Ice and finding out that the mystery man is Makoto. <gasps> Shock! Horror! Oh my god! No one ever saw that coming. We uh, yeah, beat the crap out of the Queen of Ice and free Toya. Finally by doing the switcheroo process. Toya tries to shout to stop from absorbing the Queen of Ice, but it's too late, Atuma does it. This actually was the goal all along, absorb all three Devil Golems into Infinity to unleash Infinity so he has the power to reset the world. But anyway, the place starts to fall apart as we're planning on leaving and we drop down. Atuma wakes up in a rampage as he gets too close to Infinity and his arm goes out of control. So Toya and Makoto have to fight him and bring him back, defeating like the parasitic entity that is Infinity. But Infinity doesn't need a tomb anymore. And the whole crew turn up just in time to start a fight, a fighting rounds with um, Infinity. We have to defeat him again and again and again. And in the end, Atuma has to unleash Fury, the second part of the power that he obtained from the aesthetic monk finally atomizing infinity and saving the world and the final boss is interesting in this regard because he's just following his program he's a robot there's a golem and his programming was from the sages at the time to reset the world because of the damage the golem wars had done and he couldn't go against it so it wasn't necessarily evil. It's quite interesting. It's it's a big bad that isn't. It's wanting to end the world, but not a, through any fault of its own. But anyone, everyone saves the world, and we all go back. And there's a big party a little time later where we get to see everyone meeting up again. We have the lovely Rygar and Sayaka of having a child. Uh, Makoto finally gets to kiss Toya, with some help from Atsuma, and all this sort of stuff. We get the feeling that uh, Kareen may want to marry Atsuma. But yeah, it's all great. All good. Happy ending. Woo! So, now we've survived the story retrospective, what is actually good about this game? Well, firstly the battle system. It's simple, but with enough strategy to make it interesting. The grid system adds an extra level to the standard turn-based affair, meaning each battle is actually a little different from the last. Add on this the potential for defining a team exactly how you want to with the Golems and the Humans. Even if I personally stuck with the Humans, it's got a lot of flexibility. Character development is also an area in which this game shines. It's been a very long time since I felt such a change in characters through a game. Many games where I hear it's got great character development usually end up just having characters with a single trope getting a shiny new stereotype on top of it. But in this game, the characters actually do seem to develop and grow as people as the game goes on. From Atsuma gaining a sense of self confidence and learning to fend for himself, or Rygar starting to understand his emotions and stop denying himself due to his duties, we do actually see character growth. On the flip side, there's only one thing which really drives me insane with this game, and was the reason I originally dropped it, and that's how it treats Atsuma, and by extension the player at the start of the game takes the whole Atsuma is an idiot way too far, pushing the same treatment onto us, insulting us for not knowing how to swim or use a ladder, and explaining how to do so in the most condescending manner. It's baffling that they thought it was a good idea. I mean, the ladder and the swimming thing, we probably knew how to do that anyway. Like, how common is it in games to walk up to a ladder and press a button to activate it? I mean, just say, to use ladder, press X, not, 
a whole cutscene about it. It's definitely a failed attempt on the idea of an in-game tutorial, which is amusing considering how little of a tutorial we get in From Soft Games now. As always, we have a quick look at what the critics thought of the game first before my own personal opinion. And in this case, we actually see an alignment between critics and users, scoring roughly a six between the both. Um, going to the RPG site first, we see that they give it the average score of six, stating in their conclusion, Enchanted Arms, interesting title that does some very fun and daring things with its battle system. Sadly, it's not just let down by its presentation, it's almost ruined by it. This is still worth playing the battle system, but you may want to skip out on the rest of the game has to offer. They did seem to enjoy the game, but were hung up on the overall presentation? I don't know if it's just me. Maybe playing many, I may be playing the game many, many years after its actual release. But presentation has never been my biggest concern. Like, it's not something that would knock a game unless it was truly awful. But RPG fan, different to RPG site, has this to say. A lot of people bashed on this game when it was released for the 360. And it has a similar mediocrity and sales performance on the PlayStation 3. However, I stand firm in my opinion that the game is decent, semi-epic RPG that's worth playing, if only to have such a grandiose tale to play on the next gen before Final Fantasy XIII. While the Xbox 360's RPG library grows, the PlayStation 3 is still lacking. So if you own this particular console and are looking for a good turn-based RPG to get into, this is the one, at least until something better comes out. Enchanted Arm earns an 84%, again, for being a decent RPG with few flaws and lots of adventure. For me, it's the final line that rings true. It has few flaws and lots of adventure. This is a statement I can resonate with, but the Final Fantasy XIII comment made me chuckle, considering how well that was received. So, my own personal opinion. This game does a lot right. The battle system is fun. The enemy and gun design is, is interesting, and there's a fun plot with some interesting twists and turns, if not the most complicated story in the world. But I won't deny that the start is a slog because of how it treats you. But overall, it's an interesting, this older From Software title. And I hope that one day they go back to this type of game as opposed to churning out more Souls likes. My overall rating is give it a go.